What's up? My name is Julian Williams, and I take Expedite. Some days I walk into the gym, and I don't necessarily feel like working. Take a scoop or two of this, be ready to go. It's the best stuff I've ever had. Expedite. Um, Bob flew over to me, and I didn't know how old Bob was until he told me. He said, I'm 88 years old. That was in 2019. And he says, I fly, away, I fly all over the world. And uh, he's got so much energy. You know, I've never, ever seen a work ethic like Bob Arum. Absolutely fantastic person to be around so positive. Uh, we went for a meal in London when he came over to see me for the first time. And I asked him, I said, Bob, I said, what's the motivation? I said, at nearly 90 years old, what motivates you to, to want to be a promoter? And it was like, I started off in the game with the best heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali. Uh, I'd like to go out with the best heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury. And from that moment, I believed in him. And I knew he could deliver because he delivered so many, so many big fights. Yeah, he's a legendary, legendary, unbelievable. Yes, and, for uh, sure. I hope to have many, many more big fights promoted by Bob Arum, for sure. Yeah. How was your experience to train with Emmanuel Stewart at the Crunk Gym in Detroit? Fantastic. You know, I, uh, I was a young kid when I went there. I was 21 years old. And this is an absolutely crazy story. Um, I was, it was 2009. I was 21 years old. I was the English heavyweight champion. I think I had 12 fights unbeaten. 12 and 0. Um, and I thought to myself, you know what? I want to go to America and train. And I want to go to Emmanuel Stewart, the world's greatest trainer at that time, legendary trainer. So I got on a plane and I, I went to the shop and I said, right, Detroit, please. So I got on a plane from Manchester to Detroit. I didn't even know where I was going. Went on my own to Detroit from Manchester as a young kid. Um, I flew into Detroit airport and I went to a, a cab driver and I said, can you take me to the Cronk gym, please? He said, yes, no problem. And he takes me to a place. And he said, oh, he said, the Cronk gym's closed down. And I was like, really? And he was like, let me see if it's moved somewhere. So he gets on the phone, the speaker, and he speaks to someone. He says, oh, yeah, it's moved, uh, I don't know, five miles away. So he says, I'll take you there. So I never had a contact with Emmanuel Stewart. I'd spoken to him on the phone maybe a year or two before when he was working with Andy Lee in Ireland. And... I just turned up out of the blue and I walked into the gym. Before I walked in, I said to the taxi driver, could you wait here, please, for 10 minutes and I'll be back out and we'll go back home if needed be. So I goes in the Cronk gym in Detroit. I walks in. Back then, I had a lot of uh, curly hair, a uh, big mop of curly hair. And I was uh, very, very handsome back then. <laughs> Not like the beast from the East that you see today. Um, so I walks in the gym and I says... Um, is Emmanuel Stewart here, please? And they go, uh, uh, Sugar Hill said to me, who are you? And I said, I'm the next heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury. I said, Emmanuel's probably expecting me. And he gets on the phone to Emmanuel and he goes, Manny, he said, there's a crazy looking white dude here saying he's going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Emmanuel said, what's his name? And he said, Tyson Fury. He said, send him to down to me. He was in a restaurant a few miles away with uh, HBO after the meal. And I goes into the restaurant. He makes me feel very welcome. Um, he didn't know I was coming. It was just out of the blue, randomly. And he takes me back to his home and he invites me into his home. And he says, I want you to stay with me for a few weeks and we work together. Um, I, and although I just, just met him for the second time, briefly, I felt like I knew the guy for like 10 years already. And he invited me into his home. I slept in the next bedroom to ease. Uh, he bought me a giant bed, a seven foot bed to sleep in. <laughs> the next day we went down to the gym and he treated me like a world champion, even though I only had 12 fights. He would sit down and bandage my uh, hands up, wrap me up for like 40 minutes at a time. Teach me the basics, worked on uh, the jab, the right hand, the left hook, the footwork, balance. Um, we worked on basic stuff and we talked a lot as well. Um, we talked a lot of boxing. He was quite quite impressed with my uh, boxing knowledge. Excuse the kids crying. 
to apologise. <laughs> uh, yeah, we talked about a lot of uh, boxing over the years, and, and I, I asked him a lot of questions about boxing. Um, and I was supposed to stay there for a couple of weeks. My return ticket was a couple of weeks. And he actually extended it an extra two weeks. And he said, I want you to stay for another two weeks. He said, four weeks. I said, I want to work on some stuff with you. He said, you're going to be my next heavyweight champion of the world. He said, I had a dream about a tall fighting with a long back that I was going to work with. And I never knew it was going to be a British guy. I was like, right. So we used to go down to the gym. We'd do some sparring with Jonathan Banks and some other guys. And I'd be in the ring and I'd be sparring around with these welterweights, two, three at a time. I'd say, get in, get in. Let's have a move around. Let's do some work. And then he was looking at me like, this guy is crazy. And uh, all the guys in the gym were like former world champions and stuff. And old guys sat down beside the ring. And they were like, they said, oh, we've never, we never seen anything like this. This guy is crazy. This British guy is crazy. But he's got some rhythm. Uh, and it was uh, it was like what you see in one of those American movies, like coming to America or something, where all the guys from the barbershop talking and like bantering. It was absolutely amazing. It was an amazing experience for a young person to see, to see like a proper working professional world championship gym. And I remember at that time there was um, Steve Forbes was in the gym, um, Cornelius Bondage, K9. Um, who else was there? Andy Lee came after a week or so. Um, Dimitri Salita was in the gym. Um, there was quite a few uh, world champions and things in the gym at that time. And it was one of the best experiences I've had in a long time. Um, even to this day, I'll, I remember it forever. Emmanuel treated me like I was one of his own family. He'd often take, would go out like and speak to different people. He'd introduce me to people, um, boxing people. Ref, there was a referee at that time called Frank Garza. Um, I met with Frank and his wife in a hotel. Um, I, met, I met quite a lot of people that I wouldn't have never got the opportunity to meet if I had not stayed in England. Um, and he'd take me to like bar, like restaurants, and he. I'd get up and start singing on the microphone as a young kid. I went to this like Motown bar in Detroit and we'd go there and have some food and I was singing on and everyone would just get up like a karaoke sort of thing. And everyone would be getting up and singing songs. So I said to Manuel, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get up and sing a song for everybody. So I get to the mic. I says, can I have a go? And he said, yeah, no problem. And uh, I get up and I sing, um, I sing You Look Wonderful Tonight. Uh, and everyone was up clapping. And then Eric, said, Eric Clapton. Yeah, Eric Clapton, you look wonderful tonight. And uh, everyone was up clapping and then they were saying to Mungin, who's this new kid? Who's this new kid? And he goes, This is this is my next world champion. Um and then I went back home. I had uh, Paris was we had our first child newborn at the time, Venezuela. Um and I had to, I couldn't just stay in America because um I had a wife at home to feed and look after. So I had to go back to the UK to, to, to look after my family. And when I got back, I was home for about three weeks and I get a phone call from Emmanuel. Um, and he said, would you come over to Klitschko's camp and you can work with me there. We will work um, in Klitschko camp. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I goes over there with my cousin, Huey. He was only a young kid, 14 years old at the time. He was boxing as well. So I took Huey over there for the experience. We went there. And we'd be working out with all the guys in the gym. I never did any sparring with Vladimir at the time because he was fighting Derek Chisora at that, that fight. And he was obviously a lot smaller than me, so it was too big. So me and Emmanuel would work out. And we'd talk about things. He'd ask me my advice on what about Vlad uh, Vladimir and stuff like that. And then we ended up going to... I had a fight uh, come up on the undercard of uh, Bernard Hopkins versus Jean Pascal in Quebec City. And they actually, I remember actually seeing the WBC diamond belt for the first time ever back then in uh, what year it was. It could have been 2009. Um, 2009 uh, or 10, yeah. Yes. Uh, I know it was It was made for the, the fight with Hopkins and Pascal um, right. for Quebec City, Pepsi Coliseum, Quebec City. And I boxed on the undercard and my buddy, Adam Harris, he picked up the belt. I don't know how he got it, but we had the belt in the back of his car and we were delivering it to Yvonne Michelle for the um, promotion. And I was looking at this belt and I was thinking, 
I've got to get one of these green belts someday. I've got to get one of these belts. And it was an amazing belt. Um, and Emmanuel was in the corner for that fight. He flew in from, from uh, Austria and he flew into Quebec City on the day of the fight. And he came into the changing room. He had a Hawaiian shirt on, a pair of linen trousers. He didn't bring no gear with him at all. And he's like, where's my fighter? Where's my fighter? I was like, I'm here, Emmanuel. And he said, who's got the mitts? Who's got the mitts? Who's got the bandages? Who's got the wraps? Who's got the scissors? Oh, it was absolutely hilarious. And we went out there and he was in the corner. Um, and him being in the corner, it, it was also almost like a, a confidence booster. And the information that he gave me was so crystal clear and um, short to follow, easy to follow. And we, uh, from that, after that fight, Emmanuel wanted me to go to Detroit and train with him and follow him around, like with his commitments with HBO and, and Klitschko and fly to Germany and all over the world. And at that time, I, I, I couldn't do it. I wasn't in a position to, to travel up and down the world with Emmanuel and, and be away from my wife and kids um, at that time. So I, I couldn't. I said, listen, I can't, I can't do this. I have to go back home. I'm fighting in the UK. Um, I have to get fights over there. So that's where I have to base. I said, I understand. I'm only a prospect coming up. I had uh, 13 fights then. I said, I know you can't put your full time into me. I said, but hopefully in the future we'll get to work together again. And I will become heavyweight champion one day. And he said, I'd love that. Um, and that was uh, the last time I saw Emmanuel Stewart after that. And uh, he passed away, God rest his soul, uh, maybe uh, a year later. But it was very fitting that I ended up back with a Cronk Jim, back with the nephew, um, Javen Sugar Hill. Uh, and everyone said, oh, no, this is a bad idea. And um, we don't know how good this guy is. But I worked with Sugar Hill when I was in Austria. Um, he, he would take me on the pad work and, and, and talk to me about bits, bits of things when Emmanuel was busy with Vladimir. And also in the Cronk Gym in Detroit. So I knew he, he's, the training that he did was going to work for me, for long range punching and uh, putting power into the shots with every punch. And that's why I selected uh, Sugar Hill. And it was very fitting that I became heavyweight champion under the Cronk Gym, like we always said, me and Emmanuel.